Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the first episode of Tenani. Tenani is the first phase of the Organized Harassment Project from Protect Life Now. The first phase concentrates on gang stalking. Gang stalking is stalking done by a group of individuals instead of a single stalker. In gang stalking, the person being stalked is commonly called a targeted individual, or TI for short. You're going to hear me say TI a lot. The process of harassment is called a campaign against the TI. An online search may lead to various descriptions of many methods and effects of gang stalking. Some are deliberately outrageous in order to deter any serious consideration of the issue. But this is a very serious crime that terrorizes and tortures people. However, the perpetrators can commit these crimes with little to no fear of punishment or being caught because gang stalking is not being seriously investigated by law enforcement officials. Gang stalking consists of mainly three crimes, although additional crimes are probably committed during the campaign. The three crimes involved are voyeurism, harassment, and stalking. Other crimes involved in gang stalking are fraud, rape, defamation, assaults, perjury, etc. This program is geared towards the targeted individual in order to provide a media for TIs to speak out about the gang stalking crime. It is also meant to raise public awareness by giving the public a glimpse into what is going on right under their noses. How does someone become a TI? The stalkers could select a target for any reason, real or imagined, superficial or substantial. Among other things, a bad breakup, messy divorce, fights between children, disagreements, tense collaborations, or friend turned enemy can suddenly turn anyone into a target. Gang stalkers get the inside scoop, but like any other gang, they are subjected to the leader's whims and restricted by the group's activities. So gang stalkers aren't even safe from becoming a TI. If they have a falling out with the group, they too can become a target. So the short answer is, anyone can become a TI for any reason. Gang stalking units are made up of several types of stalkers. Let's review the types of stalkers that psychiatrists have identified. The following information comes from the management of stalkers. One type of stalker is the rejected stalker. The rejected stalker is the most common type. In this group, the stalking emerges from the breakdown of a close relationship, usually, although not exclusively, sexual. These stalkers pursue the person who has rejected them to attempt reconciliation, to get revenge for the rejection, or a mixture of both. Usually, the behavior is sustained by the gratification derived from either maintaining some kind of relationship through the stalking or from causing distress. The majority of rejected stalkers are angry, dependent males who either cannot believe they have been rejected or are unwilling to accept that rejection. Although they usually have significant limitations of personality, they only occasionally have psychotic illnesses. Even though the majority may be male, don't forget that hell hath no fury over a woman's scorn. The rejection doesn't always have to be over love, but could be over friendship, business, among other things. A group, instead of a single individual, can also stalk based on rejection. Some TIs have reported being stalked because they refuse to join or maintain an affiliation with groups, organizations, or businesses. Next up is the Intimacy Seeker. Intimacy Seekers begin stalking with the aim of realizing a relationship with a person who has engaged their affections or who they erroneously believe already loves them. They are in love and endow their targets with uniquely desirable qualities. They persist in their pursuit despite or oblivious to the reactions of the victim. At the beginning of the stalking, intimacy seekers are usually living lonely, isolated lives devoid of intimacy. The fantasized relationship and the pursuit provide a fake solution to their dilemma and that's what reinforces and sustains the behavior. 
for them. Better unrequited love than no love. Better some kind of relationship, even if it's just a fantasy, than no prospect of intimacy. Intimacy seekers frequently have a major mental disorder associated with an erratomanic syndrome. So what does this have to do with gang stalking? Most TIs are put on a list before the campaigns begin. Someone has to nominate an individual to be targeted, and sometimes the nomination could be by the intimacy seeker, who can now safely stalk the individual and have the blame spread out over a group, so it's harder to trace it back to him or her. An individual can also become a target after breaking up or rejecting a gang stalker. After the nomination, the gang stalkers assess whether or not to start a campaign around the individual. So, although the original stalker is an intimacy seeker, if the group decides to start a campaign, the target is attacked by other types of stalkers too. Gang stalking involves stalking by proxy. There is also the incompetent suitor. Incompetent suitors are stalkers who pursue people to whom they are attracted in a manner that evokes the target's distress and often fear. Their targets are usually strangers or casual contacts. They are not motivated by the elevated sentiments of love, but by the desire to make contact, usually seeking a date. They lack basic courting skills and their approaches are inept and often intimidating. Stalkers of this type often possess a sense of entitlement to a relationship with the person who has caught their interest and show indifference to the target's preference in the matter. The lack of social skills may derive from the stalker's vulnerabilities of personality or occasionally from intellectual limitation. This type of stalking usually stops after a relatively brief time, presumably because there are few gratifications to sustain the behavior. Unfortunately, stalkers in this group frequently move from victim to victim in a pattern of serial harassment. They make a significant contribution to the burden of stalking in the community because they rarely persist long enough to attract prosecution. A TI's campaign may start with a nomination, but sometimes it grows so big that the original stalker gets lost in the woodwork. Just like the incompetent suitor, most of the gang stalkers frequently move from victim to victim, which is a staple of the serial harassment involved in gang stalking. It is my opinion that most gang stalkers have sociopathic or psychopathic tendencies, but instead of becoming serial killers, they become serial harassers. Serial harassment is a very good description of what happens in gang stalking. The Resentful Stalker Resentful stalkers are motivated by the desire to frighten and distress their victims. Unlike most stalkers, they are well aware of the impact of their behavior on the victim. This type of stalking emerges out of a desire for retribution against the person or organization they believe has harmed or slighted them in some way. The behavior is sustained by the satisfying sense of power and control derived from the harassment. The resentful usually feel justified in their actions and often present themselves as victims fighting back against overwhelming odds. They frequently see themselves as the little men battling for justice, irrespective of the reality that is usually characterized by their merciless harassment of a vulnerable victim. The resentful are most likely to threaten, but interestingly, don't usually proceed to physical assault. Their aim is to frighten and intimidate, and they are usually only too aware that should they assault the victim, the police will rapidly terminate their campaign. To avoid being held legally responsible, resentful stalkers often issue oblique threats. For example, placing the victim's name in the in memoriam column of a newspaper or sending around the undertakers. The workplace is where many such campaigns of harassment begin, sometimes arising out of the conflict between colleagues or with management, and sometimes occurring when clients target an employee or a professional who has disappointed their expectations. An individual can be targeted due to frictions within the workplace. Gang stalkers often engage in office mobbing to terrorize targets and inflict financial attacks.
Unfortunately, colleagues can become resentful over promotions, projects, awards, salaries, popularity, among other things. It's disturbing to know that someone can become a TI just for being a good worker. A new story about a doctor who was gang stalked by his colleagues will be presented in a later episode. Another type is the predatory stalker. The predatory stalk in preparation to a sexual assault. The initial motivation is to gather information about the potential victim. The stalking is often extended far beyond getting information and is sustained by the gratification from the voyeuristic element, from the rehearsal, from fantasies of the planned attack, and from the sense of power over the victim. The stalking is done secretly as not to alarm the victim, although some predatory stalkers take pleasure in raising the victim's anxiety by actions that let the target know he or she is being watched without revealing the identity or whereabouts of the stalker. Examples of such actions are entering the victim's home and moving articles around, tapping on the window at night, and calling out while hidden. It is my opinion that a predatory stalker is not just preparing for a sexual assault. Although there is a high chance that a TI could be sexually assaulted once she or he is discredited or perceived as mentally ill. One of the reasons for the stalking is to silence the TI, but some members of the gang probably intend to do more damage once they consider it safe to do so. I will present two news reports involving sexual assault. One is about a single stalker incident and the other is about a gang stalking incident. The following comes from Wikipedia and the National Victim Association Academy. The 2002 National Victim Association Academy defines an additional form of stalking, the vengeance slash terrorist slash political stalker. It seems as if these three types are put into one group. One thing that is different about this group compared to some of the types mentioned earlier is that the vengeance slash terrorist slash political stalkers do not seek a personal relationship with their victims, but rather force them to emit a certain response favorable to the stalker. While the vengeance stalker's motive is to get even with the other person whom he or she perceives has done something wrong to them, the political stalker intends to accomplish a political agenda also using threats and intimidation to force the target to refrain and or become involved in some particular activity, regardless of the victim's consent. I want to highlight that gang stalkers and vengeance slash terrorist slash political stalkers share a common goal to force targets to emit a certain response favorable to the stalker by using threats and intimidation to force the target to refrain and or become involved in some particular activity regardless of the victim's consent. Gang stalkers also engage in cyber stalking. According to the National Victim Association, stalking has now taken a turn into cyberspace on the information superhighway. Cyberstalking is generally used to refer to the use of the internet, email, and other telecommunication technologies to harass or stalk another person. Cyberstalking is an extension of the physical form of stalking. Most state and federal stalking laws require that the stalker make a direct threat of violence against the victim while some require only that the alleged stalker's course of conduct constitute an implied threat. Although some cyberstalking conduct involving annoying or menacing behavior might fall short of illegal stalking under current laws, such behavior may be a prelude to real-life stalking and violence and should be treated seriously. Cyberstalking has the potential to move from a URL address to an IRL in real life address, simply from virtual to actual. Cyberstalkers use a variety of techniques. They may initially use the internet to identify and track their victims. They may then send unsolicited email, including hate, obscene, or threatening mail. Live chat harassment abuses the victim directly or through electronic sabotage. For example, flooding the internet chat channel to disrupt the victim's conversation. 
With news groups, the cyberstalker can create postings about the victim or start rumors which spread through the bulletin board system. Cyberstalkers may also set up a web page on the victim with personal or fictitious information or solicitation to readers. Another technique is to assume the victim's persona online, such as in chat rooms, for the purpose of ruining the victim's reputation, posting details about the victim, or soliciting unwanted contact from others. More complex forms of harassment include mail bombs, which are mass messages that virtually shut down the victim's email system by clogging it, or sending the victim computer viruses, or sending electronic junk mail, spamming. There is a clear difference between the annoyance of unsolicited emails and online harassment. However, cyberstalking is a course of conduct that takes place over a period of time and involves repeated, deliberate attempts to cause distress to the victim. Let's recap the type of stalkers and stalking behavior. The rejected pursue ex-intimates either in the hope of reconciliation or for vengeance or out of a mixture of both. Intimacy seekers stalk someone they believe they love and who they think will reciprocate the affection. Incompetent suitors inappropriately intrude on someone, usually seeking a date or brief sexual encounter. The resentful pursue victims to exact revenge for some actual or perceived injury. The predatory usually stalk as part of preparation for a sexual offense. The vengeance stalker's motive is to get even with the other person whom she or he perceives has done something wrong to them. Terror stalkers, also known as political stalkers, intend to accomplish a political agenda. Cyber stalking refers to the use of the internet, email, and other telecommunication technologies to harass or stalk another person. Not all gang stalkers have the same agenda and each campaign is based on its own agenda. This is general information. There are many variations, but it's good to have a basic idea of what's going on. How do stalkers view the victim? How could someone actually do something like this and sleep at night? According to the National Victims Association, in addition to self-justification, stalkers often show an apparent blindness to the impact of their behavior on the victim, or at best offer a dismissive trivialization. This lack of victim empathy is not, however, universal. In those stalkers motivated by eventual resentment, there is often an acute sensitivity to the confusion, distress, and fear produced by their activities. It is this very empathy that brings satisfaction and reinforces the behavior. Likewise, in those who stalk in preparation to a sexual attack, prolonging the behavior beyond the needs of information gathering is due to the sensitivity to the victim's mounting discomfort and the pleasure taken in voyeuristic intrusions, along with the implication of humiliating exposure. Sadism, in contrast to brutality, feeds off empathy. The whole thing has an elementary school playground aspect to it. You've heard the term that kids can be cruel. Now imagine that those cruel kids never lose their cruelty and use it into adulthood. A very nasty combination. The methods are deliberately immature so that it could be easily dismissed by the stalker and those who don't know what's going on. There is also the stalker's taunt which is the equivalent to the child bully's nanny nanny poo poo taunt. On the surface, what the gang stalkers are doing can be viewed as a bunch of pranksters who take it too far, but it's not that simple. There are subliminal threats behind all these acts. By using signals and attempting to sensitize the target to the signals, the gang stalkers are sending the target a message along these lines. We know who you are and we'll follow you. We have people watching you. We can get your financial information, tax information, even how much your school loans are. We know your grooming routine and what you wear to bed at night. And there's nothing you can do about it. We can buy, play, or threaten your friends and family in order to turn them against you. We can even turn people you don't know against you. Go ahead, make a friend and we'll make sure to turn that person against you. 
We can follow you across cities, states, countries, and even continents. We're watching you closely, and you don't know who we are. We could be anyone. That little old lady, that mother pushing the stroller, that well-dressed businessman, those teenage girls hanging out, that nanny watching the kids at the playground. We could be that bus driver, train conductor, tailgating driver, ice cream man, next door neighbor, random stranger, even that little kid with the lollipop and video game. We have access to every kind of person, even ex-cons, street gangs, and drug addicts, and we can get them to do whatever we want to you. We can do whatever we want and can take you out any time we want. We are watching you at your job and can get you fired or laid off. We will leave you destitute if you mess with us. We own you and run your life now. Now child bullies would finish by saying, if you tell anyone, I'll beat you up. But gang stalkers are saying, if you tell anyone, we'll have you committed or locked up. No one will believe you. They'll think you're crazy. And we have buddies on the police force who will make sure that your case gets heard the way we want it to be. This is what those signals, gestures, and other twisted methods mean. All this can be done in public with no one but the gang stalker and the T.I. knowing what is going on. I'm not making this up. It's based on real life T.I. stories. And that is why we must act now to stop this crime. These gang stalkers are building their portfolio. That's why some targets are people of little or no influence at all. They're building their power base, practicing and attracting more people. They want to be able to destroy anyone they choose and get away with it. Their recruits start to feel a false sense of power and arrogance. The new recruits think that if they help in a campaign, then they have the gang stalkers backing if they want to put someone on the nomination list. So, you got these arrogant stalkers walking around with a bloated sense of invincibility because they think that they can have their enemies stalked, terrorized, and get away with it. And this is where the gang aspect of it comes into play. Gang stalking has been appropriately described as bullying on steroids. It's important that the public is aware of the ripple effect of bullying. The biggest misconception about bullying is that it only involves the bully and the victim. Bullies are very sensitive to their environment and their social position. They truly believe in the pecking order theory and live by that. I will go into more detail about the pecking order and ripple effect in a later episode, but here's a brief explanation. Whether or not there is a pecking order among humans is debatable, but some people are really trying to create one. Um, it was observed that chickens peck each other to decide who was dominant. What happens is that certain chickens get pecked more than others. The more dominant would get pecked less than the weaker chickens. Um, the result was a dominant chicken who no one pecked, the weak chicken who everyone pecked, and those who fit in between. Anyone who lives by this philosophy will try to be high on the pecking order. So one way to do that is through bullying and other acts of deliberate aggression. Similar to the pecking order, there are three main subjects involved in any bullying incident. Keep in mind that gang stalking incidents are essentially bullying incidents. The three subjects are the bully, the target, and the audience. The ripple effect of bullying happens when a bully attempts to tear down a target when other people are around. The effect is similar to throwing a pebble into a calm lake. Waves are created that spread for some distance. The bullying incident has a direct effect on the target but spreads to the audience. The second greatest impact is on 
those close to the target, than those who know of the target, than those who have seen the target but don't know him or her. And as word of the incident spreads and details are distorted, it affects those further away from the target and bully to a lesser degree. But consider the range one bullying incident reaches. So the bully becomes feared among more people than just a target, and there's also an impact on how the target is perceived across the same range. Now, how the target and the bully is perceived depends on the society's values. The current trend is that the bully will be perceived as the dominant one and will be feared if the attack is successful. Therefore, she or he is raised in the so-called pecking order. It's important for you to note that I said if the attack is successful. Targets have the ability to neutralize a bully incident. More detail will be given on that in a later episode. Right now, I would like to concentrate on what society is doing, and right now, in society, the bully would be viewed as dominant and would be feared, but all that can change, and change is what we need. I don't think many people really desire a society based on the pecking order theory. I would like to think that human beings are a bit smarter than chickens. Do we really want to follow the social order of poultry? You know, (laughs) I always thought that underneath it all, bullies were a bunch of scaredy cats, but I was wrong. (laughs) They're really a bunch of chickens. Tenani seeks to eliminate the division between the TI and the public because gang stalking affects everybody. It is happening while people shop, visit the library, walk down the street, in even the safest neighborhoods. Sometimes gang stalkers use innocent bystanders to participate in a campaign without letting the person know what is going on or the purpose of their actions. Everywhere that there are people, gang stalking can and is happening. What does a gang stalker look like? These are usually normal looking people of all ages, ethnicities, socioeconomic status, education levels, etc. They are about as identifiable as a serial killer that just got the first victim, which means nothing really stands out about most of them. They have friends, families, and lead pretty normal lives on the surface, that is. That's the image that they portray to the public. But gang stalkers usually lead a double life that only a select few know about. This includes their fellow gang stalkers and targeted individuals. So why do they hide? They hide because they're criminals. (laughs) Gang stalking is not just one crime, but a series of crimes in one. According to one California news report, someone found guilty of gang stalking could face criminal conspiracy and stalking charges, all of which are felonies in California. The gang stalkers want to terrorize people without facing the consequences. Some are even high-end officials that have a lot to lose. So why do they do it? Since very few would admit to participating in this crime, it's up in the air. But stalkers are only one piece of the triad. Remember that gang stalking, like bullying, involves three main subjects. The stalker, the targets, and the audience. The targets are the victims of this crime, and gang stalkers work hard to get their victims to commit suicide or to be committed into asylums or get arrested, so no one will believe the victim and the public's blindfold will always be on. While there may be cases that are due to people who are actually mentally ill, there are more legitimate cases, and as more and more TIs are interviewed and more is learned about the gang stalking crime, it will be easier to get the correct information, and that's one of the goals of this program. The other goals are raising public awareness, getting help for the victims, exposing the stalkers, and much more. This crime is escalating, and part of the reason is because law enforcement agencies are slow to recognize it, so it has become a safe crime to commit. Some of the recruits to gang stalking are teenagers, college students, and ex-criminals. 
These groups can easily start their own gang stalking units and by using the current technology, their units can easily and quickly get big. This poses a danger for other students um, in the case of teenagers and college students um, because it will be it will probably be very hard for them to get assistance and explain what is happening. Don't let the term gang mislead you. As I said before, the members of these stalking groups can be anyone and this crime can occur in the most affluent neighborhoods or even the most poorest. Um, as you will see, the targets come from diverse backgrounds also. Remember that anyone can become a TI for any reason. There are people who are being gang stalked and don't even know it. Most TIs don't realize what is happening for months or even years later. I will have an episode later on that will present the signs that someone may be getting gang stalked, so stay tuned for that. Some people may be hearing this for the first time or about this crime for the first time, but gang stalking is nothing new. Similar activities date back to biblical times as with murder and adultery, so don't be misled into thinking it's okay because it's been around so long. Uh, the tactics are actually very similar to bullying. Stalkers are probably unreformed bullies that never really matured as they aged. The groups are also made up of people who just follow the crowd or, you know, just go along because they're afraid of becoming targets themselves. The gang stalking methods are based on those used by the KKK, the Nazis, and other extremist, gr extremist groups. It has been updated to terrorize people within the current legal framework. Some people may be lured into the groups by gang members who tell them that, you know, there's something wrong with the target or tell them lies about the targets or they say that, oh, we're just having fun or messing with this person's head. Come, come, come along, join us. Or some other excuse that makes it seem like what they're doing is pretty harmless. But I will go into depth about that and also um, have details about the methods that are being used in later episodes, so stay tuned. This is just an overview about gang stalking, but you will learn more and more about gang stalking if you regularly tune in to Tenani. Um, as TI's stories are shared and public awareness is raised, it will become clear that something needs to be done now. Targeted individuals who want to um, share their stories can send us an email at protectlifenow at yahoo.com or visit the Protect Life Now YouTube channel for more information. There are a lot of websites and organizations that offer information about gang stalking, and as the show continues, that information will be made available. Please remember that gang stalkers work hard to discredit targeted individuals, so you may find some outrageous sites created by gang stalkers, as I said earlier. Um, please also remember that TIs are victims of a crime that the legal system is failing to recognize and investigate. They receive no help and have difficulty getting people to understand how serious this crime is. So if there is a lot of venting and anger, um, on the websites that you visit or the blogs that you visit, be compassionate. Most of these people are not, not crazy. Um, it's a horrifying situation to be in. Don't be quick to dismiss gang stalking if you come across these types of blogs or sites. Please send Protect Life Now an email and link to the questionable sites and um, we'll try to find out more information. You might find some things on technological weapons being used on targets. Um, those topics will be addressed in later episodes, so stay tuned for that. Uh, that is the end of the introduction to gang stalking. I'm currently working on some TI interviews, so stay tuned for that in later episodes. It's time now uh, to get some tips on how to handle gang stalking. So you're forced into a system of unwanted pursuit? Here's the survival tip. 
What do you do when a gang stalker strikes and tries to make it seem as if you are overreacting or crazy? For example, a gang stalker has followed you to the library. He has indicated that he is a gang stalker and has tried to start conversation and makes appearances wherever you sit. You are engaged in reading when he suddenly shows up and asks you to watch his computer. Um, you ask him not to talk to you and move away quickly. He looks at you as if you are overreacting and has a fellow gang stalker nearby to reinforce that idea to the audience. Uh, the audience is wondering why you behave like that when he just asked you to watch his thing so he could go to the bathroom. A normal request under normal circumstances. But only you and the gang stalkers know what is really going on. So what do you do? Well, you know that gang stalkers will usually fake innocence and maintain a calm demeanor while trying to pressure you to respond erratically. One of the supporting stalkers may secretly give their signal in an effort to further agitate you, or they may try to do something that may seem as a harmless joke and will take advantage of the fact that you will be the overly serious slash uptight adult while they play the fun prankster. Okay, so you have different options. I'm not going to go and give out specific tips because stalkers are probably listening and will work around it. And also because everyone has their own way of handling things. What may work for one person may or may not work for you. So general tips will be given and you can figure out on your own um, how, what methods you can use and tweak it to suit the campaign and gang stalkers that are being used against you. The most important thing right now is that you know what is going on and get some idea about how to handle it. Uh, don't play along. Don't play their game. Act like the no fun disciplinarian and let them know that their attention and contact is unwanted. Stalkers are delusional. They start to believe that they know you and that you should know them and be afraid because they give you some silly signal. The truth and reality of the situation is that they don't know you and you don't know them. Think about how much an obsessed fan may know about their favorite celebrity or how much information is available on that celebrity. If that person knows all the good and bad things and talk about the celebrity all the time with their friends, uh, how comfortable would the celebrity be if this obsessed fan approached the celebrity and acted as if she or he knew them forever? Well, the bodyguards would probably be called in very quickly. TIs are like underground celebrities with hostile, obsessed fans. People you don't know think they know all about you. In Hollywood, ruthless social climbers try to get close to celebrities to gain social clout. Similarly, gang stalkers may try to use you as a stepping stone to gain clout or impress their friends. But in order to gain that clout, they must harm you in some way. So TIs must be extra careful who they let or keep in their lives. Again, no matter how much information they have, what they've been shown, they don't know you because the information that they're given is filled with a lot of lies and half-truths. Gang stalkers lack the appropriate social boundaries. They like to force themselves into people's lives. They have difficulty facing the reality that no matter what they've been told or think they know about you, they don't know you. Reinforce this boundary and don't buy into their delusions. Also, remember, they want to show something to tell their stalking buddies. So be bland, firm, and direct, even if it's not in your personality. If you think that you can beat them at their own game and turn the tables, do so, but cautiously. This isn't recommended because these people are cowards and hardly ever strike without backup. If you choose this route, be prepared to handle more than one heckler. A different stalker is probably nearby and ready to jump in. Take note that gang stalkers usually don't engage unless it's part of a plan, so don't participate when they're baiting you. The better thing to do is to cut it short, 
reinforce the boundaries, and move away. Sometimes their goal is to get you to move all over the place. So try to change your seat or position as little as possible. Always try to position yourself in a place that will be hard for them to surround or disturb you, especially without disturbing the audience if there are any audience. Also learn how to effectively deal with these direct but covertly aggressive tactics so that you don't have to move away unless it gets dangerous. And that's it for now. If you have tips to share, please email them to protectlifenow at yahoo.com. Now it's time for FYI, essential information for TIs. One of the biggest problems TIs have is how to respond when being agitated and provoked by gang stalkers. No matter how a TI responds, gang stalkers will try to twist it in a way that makes a TI look bad. You are about to receive some tips on how to handle that right now. If a stalker makes contact and attempts to talk to a TI, but the TI walks away and cuts them off, the stalker will try to make a TI feel as if she or he overreacted or are unfriendly, even though it was a completely appropriate response under the circumstances. Gang stalkers will probably make a joke of it and try to agitate the TI further. This is another version of the stalker's taunt. Most of these overt tactics are similar to the bullying tactics from elementary to high school. As in the days of youth, most of the overt tactics were covering the more devious, covert tactics. Anyone who had siblings or watched kids should recognize these tricks. What makes it bizarre is that it's being done by people who are supposed to be mature adults. If a friend told you that they did these things, it may seem funny or harmless, but imagine a person constantly being subjected to this type of treatment. The criminal aspect is that these tricks are also being used to drive people crazy, drive them to suicide, drive them to violence, and destroy their lives. Not so funny after all. The gang stalkers blindfold the general public so they can't see what's really going on, but someone at the receiving end knows what's really going on. Nine times out of ten, TIs aren't overreacting. So, a TI needs to find some way to be certain that what is happening is a gang stalking incident. TIs have to separate the gang stalkers from the audience because gang stalkers will try to play the audience and the TI against each other. TIs also must remember that the audience doesn't know what is really happening and respond in a way that effectively neutralizes the harassment. If you have essential tips for TIs, please email protectlifenow at yahoo.com. TIs, it's time to know my enemy. In case you didn't get that, this part of the show is called Know Thy Enemy. Even though gang stalkers hide their identity and many different people are involved, it is important for a TI to know their enemies in order to effectively protect themselves. Here's a short, simple, and entertaining way to get to know your enemy. In addition to watching them watch you, if you want to learn more about some tricks and methods that gang stalkers will probably use, Watch TV shows, movies, and videos that features bullies or tough girl, tough guy types. Yes, art imitates life, imitates art, imitates life, imitates art, imitates life, imitates art. You get the drift. Some people borrow their personality from TV shows. This may seem simple, but remember, you're not dealing with the best and the brightest, so the mainstream media can help you a lot in this area. Try it and send your feedback to protectlifenow at yahoo.com. Ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats and turn off or mute your cell phones, pagers, and beepers. The show is about to begin. It's time for street theater. 
<laughs> what is street theater? It's bad acting that gang stalkers do to get a TI's attention and cause some kind of disturbance. To the audience or general public, it appears like some people acting silly, but the gang stalkers are actually trying to send a message to the TI by letting him or her know that stalkers are aware of their location and is following them. This is also done to elicit an incriminating, discrediting, or crazy reaction from the TI. Take note that this is a serious and harmful tactic that is used to slowly wear the TI down. In an effort to help TIs cope, I wanted to offer some comic relief because sometimes the street theater is just so incredibly stupid that a TI can't even take it seriously. So here are the funnier street theater. Um, to share the most ridiculous street theater that you've seen, please write it out, give the county and state, and send it to protectlifenow at yahoo.com. The street theater comes from Westchester, New York. It was a lovely day, so I headed to the beach. I found a good spot, but I saw a gang stalker who tried to stalk me at the beach before. This time, he arrived ahead of me. He was a middle-aged man with receding brown hair and a muscle shirt, although he didn't have any arm muscles. His back was to me, and he was pretending to enjoy the scenery. It was a breathtaking view of the Hudson with sailboats decorating the water, a charming gazebo on an adjacent island, and a luxurious beach house on the opposite island. There was a community of geese and their babies playing near the shore. The birds were singing and the squirrels were scurrying about. It was such a peaceful scene that I could even pretend that the stalker was a decent human being. As always, the phone rang and he checked it, then turned and looked at me. I thought he would creep over and try to terrorize me, but he just turned his back and continued to look into the water. I laid back and enjoyed the better part of the scenery. I started to think that maybe there was hope for gang stalkers. Maybe they weren't all cold-blooded and still had some feeling left. There was hope for anyone who could be so swept away by this beautiful environment. He walked down the steps and started to pick up things. The area was clean, but I thought he was picking up some garbage that someone must have left behind. I became even more hopeful for them. Maybe these gang stalkers weren't so bad, just a bit misguided, but anyone who was willing to pick up litter and keep the beach clean had to have a heart. He went into a bushy area and found an opening that allowed a peek at the open water. He stood quietly for a little while and then started to throw the garbage over. I wondered why he did that. He stopped, as if watching something. Then he picked up some more garbage and began to throw it. I didn't know what he was doing or why he was doing it. He continued to throw things over into the water. A few minutes later, I saw the community of geese swim quickly away from the area that was blocked by the bush. So much for having hope for gang stalkers. True to his cruel nature, he even stalked the peaceful geese. I realized he was throwing rocks, not garbage. He continued to pick and throw the rocks until the geese and the babies swam further into the water and out of his range. He wiped his hand as if the job was well done and walked away looking completely satisfied with himself. The gang stalker disappeared back into the hole he crept out of. <sighs> I shook my head and was glad that the geese were able to safely get away from him. When the geese realized that it was safe, they swam back to the shore. The geese parents watched as the babies explored the beach. The stalker was gone for now and peace was restored until the terrorists struck again. I really wanted a reason to believe that the gang stalkers still had hearts, but they were always able to prove me wrong on one point. Just when I thought the gang stalkers couldn't stoop any lower, they always prove me wrong. Now it's time for... 
TI News. I'm always looking for news stories about stalking, especially gang stalking. So if you find a news story that appeared in an official news source, please email it to protectlifenow at yahoo.com. So here's the news for today. This news story is called Under Siege, Stalking Victims Speak Out by Joy Victory, and it comes from ABC News. As her marriage started to fall apart, Donna Hurst just wanted a divorce and a clean break. Her husband wouldn't stand for it, though. And when Hurst tried to move herself and her young children away from him, he began stalking her, often with violent results. He'd find me and sometimes rape me as punishment for trying to leave him, said Hurst of Arizona. I moved from place to place, just leaving everything behind. He'd always break in. He'd tell me, nobody cares. Nobody's paying attention. He was often right. Police usually let him go. Finally, after three years, he ended up in jail serving a lengthy sentence. Although even in lockup, he sent more than 300 letters to her house, she said. As savage as it may seem, Hearst is just one of millions out there, and as new statistics show, the problem is not going away. About one out of every 22 people in a nationwide survey of nearly 10,000 U.S. residents reported that they had been stalked, according to the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control overseen by the Center of Disease Control and Prevention. Put another way, it means that about 4.5% of the entire U.S. population has experienced stalking, a finding similar to another large survey taken about 10 years ago. The problem clearly isn't going away, and in many instances, lax state laws or uninformed police officers exacerbate the problem. However, victims' advocates say there has been a slow but steady change in the public's mindset about the seriousness of stalking. Most people now understand how obsessively possessive or disruptive behavior is often a red flag that a person can turn deadly. As many as three-fourths of female murder victims were being stalked by the perpetrator before they were killed, experts say. Part of this is attributed to the victims who, once nearly driven into isolation by their stalkers, find empowerment by sharing their stories with anyone who will listen, especially police officers. This is exactly what National Center for Victims of Crime spends a lot of time doing, encouraging women like her to tell their personal and gripping accounts. A harrowing 911 call. Like hers, Florida grandmother Nancy Morgan has a chilling tale of stalking. She, too, tells her story on behalf of the National Center for Victims of Crime in hopes that it will raise awareness about the seriousness of the crime. In the months preceding March 2005, her daughter Julie Hernland frequently complained to her about an old friend who wouldn't leave her and her husband, Ianis, alone. The stalker, David Edward Johnson, had become irrationally and incorrectly convinced that the couple had ratted out his drug business to the police. Because of that, he relentlessly harassed them. He had tried to run them off the road and threatened them in a parking lot. He told them he had a 9mm gun in the car and that he was going to shoot them, Morgan said. He also repeatedly called their home and hung up, and Morgan suspects he may also have filled an anonymous complaint to Child Protective Services accusing the Hernlands of being bad parents. Still, no one was prepared for how the story would end in March. Johnson broke into their home at night, shooting and killing the couple. The only person left alive was their five-year-old daughter who called 911 to report the crime. Morgan points out stalking is not only a mere annoyance to the victim, it often leads to brutal acts of crime. The after effects linger for years. She's now raising a six-year-old child who will grow up knowing her parents were brutally murdered. Working for change. Often, taken as individual acts, stalking can be seen as harmless. If someone leaves roses on someone's doorsteps, people think that's sweet, Larry said. But if that's a signal from the stalker who would always give roses after some horrible thing happened, it was his message, I know where you are, you can't hide from me. So police are taught to take detailed case histories and to help victims get in touch with crime advocates who can provide services like finding new shelters. They also attend sessions where they listen to victims speak about their experiences. Like most crimes and most public health issues, you have to have a coordinated response. It can't just be the victim trying to prevent this thing, she said. It's a pretty difficult crime to prevent, so the most important tool for prevention is awareness, training, and education. 
my commentary on this article is that in the case of gang stalking, too many times the TI is told that he or she is suffering from a mental illness such as paranoia and sent away with no assistance. Gang stalking needs to be recognized and investigated and I'm going to keep saying that over and over and over again until it's finally done. For the public to get a picture of what happens to TIs. Let's use the example of a single stalker leaving roses on the doorsteps. Um, if you recall from the article, it stated that if someone leaves roses on someone's doorsteps, people think it's sweet. Um, and that was a quote from Leary. And he continued by saying, but if that's a signal from the stalker who would always give roses after some horrible thing has happened, it was his message, um, I know where you are and you can't hide from me. So now let's take the activities of a single stalker and magnify it by having random strangers commit the same act wherever the victim or TI goes. So in gang stalking, the person would find a rose or something pertaining to a rose almost everywhere they went. When they go to work, a gang stalker co-worker may suddenly have a vase of roses on her desk. At a restaurant where a gang stalker waitress um, works, she may recommend the special dish of the day or something on the menu that has a rose in its name. At the gas station, the gang stalker cashier may be wearing a t-shirt with a rose on it. Random people who are stalkers um, may have a conversation about roses where the TI can hear. A woman may repeatedly call out the name Rose, come here, come here, Rose, come here. She might call that out, pretending that that is the name of the person whose attention she is trying to get. Some stalkers may carry roses every other block that the TI passes or have their kids carry roses where the TI can see them. An elderly woman wearing a rose brooch bumps into the TI, <laughs> quote, accidentally, unquote. A young woman wearing a hairband with roses on it may get rude or act hostile to the TI. A few cars blasting songs that mention roses may pass by the TI. On every corner, People with something visibly pertaining to a rose may intentionally try to walk into the TI pretending not to notice and pretending that nothing happened. To an outsider, this may seem like pure coincidence or isolated events, but it is systematically terrorizing the target. This is the part of the campaign. This part of the campaign is done deliberately to make it difficult for the TI to report because it appears that random people happen to be conversing, carrying roses, or having on something that pertains to a rose. It is also to create the illusion that the TI is paranoid or suffering from some other mental illness. There probably will also be a gang stalker spreading rumors that the TI is mentally ill to try and reinforce the idea in the audience's mind. This is done consistently. So once the TI is sensitized to the roses and notices whenever a rose is mentioned or talked about, the gang stalkers will start to intimidate, harass, and agitate, and probably um, abuse or assault the target while using the rose theme. So if the target reports that a man following her around or a woman who picked a fight with her was a gang stalker and that the TI was certain because the man was carrying a book about roses and the female was wearing a charm bracelet with roses on it and then the TI proceeds to explain that the rose signals um, that the gang stalkers use um, sensitized her to it, the cops or whomever the TI confided in confided in will probably think the person's will probably think the TI is crazy. And that's how gang stalking works, to discredit the target so that no one believes him or her when they report what is happening. It starts off like this, but it gets worse. Once the target is discredited, the harassment becomes worse, including assaults, rapes, theft, among other things. There, there's a method to the gang stalker's madness. It's not just about physical or psychological attacks. TIs are often driven into poverty or financial stress because the stalkers try to ruin their career and try to prevent the TI from making a decent living. Yes, this is a very serious crime. This is a very serious crime and that's why action needs to be taken now.
Members of organized harassment groups get bolder with every TI that is taken down, and they intend to have anyone who doesn't meet their approval eliminated. The next article comes from Raleigh, North Carolina. The accused will be referred to as the woman. The title is Former State Judicial Employee Charged with Stalking and was posted on Wednesday, April 13, 2011 by News and Observer of Raleigh. Wake Sheriff's investigators on Tuesday arrested a former state judicial employee on charges that she used her work computer to impersonate a male acquaintance and have literature and magazines depicting a gay lifestyle sent to the man's workplace, home, and family. The investigators also accused a former state employee of using the man's name to place ads in gay periodicals seeking to meet people for sex according to court records made public Tuesday morning. The Wake County Sheriff's Office charged a woman with one misdemeanor count of stalking according to an arrest warrant filed by the Wake County Magistrate's Office. The woman worked as a business systems analyst for the North Carolina Administrative Office of the Courts from February 1, 2010 until February 18, when her job ended, according to an AOC spokeswoman. Sheriff's investigators think the offense occurred between December 21st and December 28th while the woman was working for the state. Phyllis Stevens, a sheriff's spokeswoman, declined to say why the investigators think the accused impersonated the man. Investigators think she used her state computer to impersonate the man and bill the cost of the books and magazines to him. He told investigators that the ads placed by the woman caused strangers to contact him, court's records show. Sheriff's investigators have accused the woman of harassing him on more than one occasion and causing substantial emotional distress by placing that person in fear of death, bodily injury, and continued harassment, according to the arrest warrant. The victim is not identified in the court documents, nor do investigators say how they learned of the alleged offenses. The accused was released on $1,000 bond on Tuesday and ordered not to have any contact with the man as a condition of her release from the Wake County Jail. My commentary on the article is that I mentioned earlier that high-end officials, even those who work for the judicial system, participate in gang stalking. Not to say that everyone in the judicial system participates in this activity, it's just some people. Uh, this is an example that shatters the illusion that the public official, high-end business people, don't participate in these types of activities. A fancy title and workplace doesn't mean that they can't be involved in stalking or gang stalking. The more affluent gang stalkers use their wealth, power, connections, and public image against victims and to hide their involvement in the crime. <laughs> That's it for this episode. I had more newspaper articles to share with you, especially some that are really specific to gang stalking, but I ran out of time, so I'll present them in the next episode. If you would like to share your story with Tenane, please check out the Protect Life Now channel's organized harassment page on YouTube for more information. You can also um, email us at protectlifenow at yahoo.com for more information. If any gang stalkers disagree with the information presented, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. Uh, thank you all for listening and I'll talk to you next time.